Thank you very much. Yeah, presentations went so fast. I was caught by a surprise. It's already my turn to uh, present the uh, technical infrastructure. Um, but it's always uh, a pleasure to uh, to stand here and to um, yeah give a bit of an overview of what we've all been doing in the past year, the kind of main lines of activities that are taking place. Um, yeah, and thanking especially a few people who have been doing a lot of uh, hard work in order to make sure that the uh, infrastructure and specifically the technical infrastructure is um, running smoothly. I'm very happy to be uh, to be here, and especially in uh, in Leuven, in Belgium, since my roots are also uh, in this country. So I, I'll try to take you also on board on small, um, how to say, uh, touristic uh, uh, trip through the. Um, yeah, through the country um, and I'll try to do that um, using uh, some yeah okay it's in order now um, using the metaphor of a glimpse into our kitchen um, it, there's many similarities there between technical infrastructure and cooking uh, we can have uh, some some philosophical conversations about that during uh, the dinner maybe tonight or in the coffee break which will take part after this uh, session um, but nevertheless, it can sometimes be really interesting to, you know, to look a bit behind the scenes, especially in, you know, the places with the open kitchens, you get a bit of an idea what is happening. I hope to give you a bit of insight today also in what is all happening into our kitchen. Um, and uh, related to that, uh, there's a small kind of riddle hidden in the presentation. If you look well at the pictures, you might be able to put it all together into a specific recipe of a traditional uh, Belgian Flemish uh, dish. But that's for the end. We will uh, have a look. Um, first, something on our centers. Uh, as you know, we are um, a distributed research infrastructure. And so um, our centers are really the, the core of it. We're a network of those centers who are situated all over Europe. Um, and having a strong network is really important. So that's also why there is so much activity within Claren. I mean, as I just reported, for instance, under the Center Assessment Committee, there's lots of activities going on here. There's lots of interaction with potential centers, with centers who want to go through an assessment. There's a whole um, lot of work in, in this area. And it's also good to be able to report that we have uh, this year uh, managed to to recognize two newbie centers. So it's uh, Claren Latvia and Claren Iceland, uh, who just um, yeah managed to establish a repository and also get it through the whole certi certification procedure. So I mentioned it already beforehand. What steps this um, this is, is uh, yeah this, what steps are needed in order to get this uh, certification? So it's absolutely non-trivial. Um, there's also the reassessment of three centers. So as you might know, every three years, you have to go through the assessment procedure again. And again, this is also not trivial because, for instance, the quarter seal is changing, your repository is changing a little bit. There's all kinds of checks that come with this. Um, the people from the BBAW, uh, ILC for Claren in Italy, and uh, the Sachsische Akademie der Wissenschaften in uh, Germany uh, managed to go through this reassessment. Um, uh, then maybe on a more, um, yeah, uh, how to say, uh, realistic sites, uh, we also saw five B centers that were downgraded to C centers. So basically meaning that they didn't reapply in time to uh, go um, yeah, through the full procedure and to maintain their B center status. Um, three of them decided not actively not to reapply for uh, reassessment um, because of all of kind of internal organizational uh, reasons. Um, but it also means, um, or how should I say? It? No, it, it, it's the other way around. It doesn't mean that those centers are not pr uh, providing the services anymore. So actually, the repositories are still out there. You can still use them. It's just that they d decided not to uh, be able to yeah, put in the effort of going through the reassessment. I think it is a kind of um, side effect also of the fact that we are really already running for some time. I mean, this 10 years of uh, or yeah, plus for, of uh, Claren activities. And um, some of these centers already went twice through assessment and a reassessment afterwards. Uh, yeah, sometimes things are changing. Um, I'm still very glad that those the resources and the repositories there are in there. But I think it's in a way a kind of sign of an evolving and maturing infrastructure that sometimes the landscape is changing and uh, not everybody is able to remain uh, a B center. Um, then 
two others are uh, currently or have been migrating their repositories as the IDS and Sprogbanken. And so they will apply in a later round. Actually, uh, I think Sprogbanken already applied in the previous round now. IDS will be doing it in uh, one of the next rounds. So there's, there's a lot of, how to say, um, yeah, evolution happening there. Um, and in a way, it's also good. I mean, um, especially if you if you're trying to provide the best service to your local researchers and your customers, it's important to be able to evolve. And this is a, a sign of that, I think. Okay, this is a graphical overview of uh, where we are with the centers. So overall, there's currently 21 certified B centers. There's uh, 70 registered centers. So this is B centers, knowledge centers, C centers, etc. And um, there's still 10 centers in the review pipeline. I mean, you just saw the, the a diagram that uh, Menzo had prepared, um, it takes a while. So that's normal that there's also um, a large pipeline, so to say. There's two new centers that are uh, currently going for assessment and eight reassessments. So it's kind of a natural way of, uh, of evolving. Um, important reminder for those who are interested in participating in the upcoming autumn assessment round, the deadline is 31st of October, so really end of this month. If you are not sure whether you should apply or if you have questions, please uh, come to me in the coffee break. We can discuss it. Uh, we'll be happy to go into the details and, and help you decide whether or not to submit for this uh, upcoming round. Good. Then we have federated identity. This is the technology that allows you to log into remote services using your own academic credentials. So you use your own institutional uh, username, password in order to access, say, a corpus search engine uh, in another country, for instance. Um, we have some numbers here again. So right now we have uh, 26 servers and members. Uh, 24 out of those 26 have been connected to what we call a service provider federation. So meaning that you basically can use that federated login to access remote resources. Um, the newest addition there was uh, Switzerland. Uh, so the Swiss users can already using uh, can already use the remote services. Spain is on the way. We did really our best to be able to announce it here today, but there's some internal procedures that need to be taken. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, yeah, within now and a month or so, uh, we can also happily announce that the Spanish users will be able to log in to all the Claren uh, services. So. That's also good on the way. We're moving there towards 25 out of 26. Um, the total number of organizations that can log in today is approaching 2,500. This is a lot, obviously. I mean, you don't need to, to um, mention that. But I think it's important to realize that this also means this really from all kind of institutions all over Europe, people are using this also to log in. It also means there's a lot of, how to say, pressure on support requests because with such numbers, every day something doesn't work or uh, there's a problem with attribute release or what have you. So there's a lot of activities here also behind the scenes in following up with individual uh, yeah, uh, researchers who, who report the problems, um, contacting the, the, in the institutions uh, behind the identity providers, making sure it all works. Again, this is one of the nice parts, I think, of um, a well-working infrastructure, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes in the internal kitchen that you don't realize as an end user. And I think as a nice anecdote, um, I recently talked with someone setting up a service provider and he basically moved from the side of a user yeah, logging into the services to someone providing such a service. And he said, I never realized this was so much work to set it up. And of course it's true. It's maybe an annoying uh, reality that it is so much work and so much bureaucracy and te technical work. But on the other hand, it also means that if it is an end user, you don't perceive that it's really important and really good about the fact that this is hidden away. So you can just use it, it works. Um, and you, you don't need to know about all the difficulties and all the technical um, yeah, um, uh, subtleties that are happening behind, uh, behind the scenes. So I think it's a, a good sign of a working infrastructure if people make comments like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is um, a kind of very rough estimation about how much the federated login is used. Again, it's not complete. It's only connected to some of the of the services that go through the central discovery service, but it gives an ID. And uh, it's interesting to to see there that um, yeah, there's been a peak in 2020, 21. Um, 
Uh, no, especially 2021, well, this was the corona period. So we've all seen kind of peaks in user statistics there with more people working remotely, having yeah, uh, the, the, the time or the opportunity to to log in and to play around with uh, things. But right now, if you see it, I think the growth is kind of more natural again. So it went a little bit down, but nothing very dramatic. Um, and maybe also good to mention here that in the... Um, amount of things that we tried to address one of the things that we still had was uh, the collection of uh, signatures for the service provider federation this is a boring administrative story but basically it came down to the fact that people needed to sign some uh, put some signature and then send the scans to us we finally moved towards a, a digital um uh, procedure for signing so this can now go very quickly we had uh, just uh, yesterday i think uh, the approval of the addition of a new service provider during the center committee meeting well we managed to send out the electronic forms on the same day um and yeah we already got the signature back so now we can implement it i'm sure today or tomorrow the service provider will be openly available and connected so this kind of agility something that we try to uh, to achieve then over to persistent identifiers, another uh, very beloved uh, topic. Um, it's been a lot of work on this behind the scenes. Uh, maybe good to mention also that we now have our first center who is actually making use of the offer that we have as Clarin to acquire um, DOIs uh, through data site. And so the IDS Institute in Mannheim has been um, yeah, uh, getting a specific prefix and will use this in the setup of its new uh, repository. A related uh, topic is the release of the uh, DOG, the Digital Object Gateway, uh, where uh, Michal did a lot of uh, work on, on getting that actually released. Um, I'll show you in a, in a second how it actually is, uh, is working. Maybe before I go into that, um, if you're interested in these topics, this afternoon we will have the bazaar and there will be a poster on the topic of persistent identifiers and how we are taking this up also in the context of the faircore for eosc project so have a look and visit uh, poster 25 you'll get some more uh, more details um, there's also links in this presentation so it will be provided online through the website afterwards so you can click through and look a bit if you're if you're curious for the doc we have created also a specific landing page clarin.eu slash doc now, what is this famous dog? The dog stands for Digital Object Gateway. And as you can see here, there's a kind of um, illustration of what it actually can do. Uh, first of all, maybe nice to, to mention, this is a kind of virtual presence that uh, Francesca and I had the pleasure of presenting to the uh, Humanum Consortium, the, the French Consortium, at their 10th anniversary birthday uh, just a few weeks uh, ago. Uh, it contains some very nice... Um, links to, to relevant resources, like there is a uh, uh, Corpus Joyeux Anniversaire uh, with people singing uh, songs and all kinds of annotations connected to that. You can have a look. If you're curious, uh, you can uh, go into the QR code or uh, open up the handle and you will find it. Now, but this is um, kind of the, the, the background for this. Now, what the doc actually can do is it can take the persistent identifier, so the handle, and then turn it into something machine processable. So it has three ways of delivering that. Uh, first one is uh, a web interface, as you can see here. It's an alpha version, so it's still very rudimentary. It's, it's not very nicely designed, but the basics are there. And then basically what it can do, it recognizes the persistent identifier as coming from a specific repository. In this case, it's a virtual collection. So it communicates or it, it extracts the metadata that is provided from the from the virtual collection registry and it provides you with some standard fields so for instance a persistent identifier the title which is missing here but we will be looking into that a description and then most uh, importantly the referenced resources so that is a landing page and three different uh, urls in this case or persistent identifiers um, now as an end user you can use this web interface to browse through these things but you also can use programmatic interfaces so the dog is also available as a python library so from the comment line you can just say okay i have this pid can you please give me the urls that are linked to from here and you can also use it as a rest service um this might sound very technical and behind the scenes but the nice thing is that this can be used in different contexts so this will also be allow us in the next stage to use uh, the dog, for instance, to get from a, um, a virtual collection towards things that are processable, that you then can further on process 
through the language resource wage board and through all those nice tools that are connected from the Clarence centers. Um, again, take a look at the poster this afternoon. There's some nice illustrations and maybe some, uh, some demos also to be seen. Then we get to a favorite topic of all of us, metadata, of course. Um, so there's been a lot of activity going on here. Um, some smaller updates on Virtual Language Observatory in version uh, 4.11. Um, besides that, there's also been a lot of work done uh, by Twan on the, the prototype for the VLO 5.0. Um, and you can see a kind of yeah, first alpha version of it here. I mean, it doesn't look very spectacular, but what is spectacular if you really start playing with this is the speed. It's really um, very um, yeah, fast in, in responding. And that's also due to kind of um, new front end uh, technology that we are testing out. Um, but what is also interesting here is actually what is happening behind the scenes. So again, the VLO 5.0 will be targeted very much towards um, the use of its internal APIs. So the internal APIs will be exposed to the outside world. And as user, you will be able to call it or to search for specific things and then render it in your own environment. And I think this is very much an important direction to move towards. This is also recognized in our uh, updated uh, strategy and so giving the possibility to users that could be consortia or specific uh, community around specific kind of language resources to use the API and to extract information. And then for instance, fill a portal or um, give some integration with websites where you can quickly search into a restricted selection of all the records that are available in VLO. Right now there's some, I don't know, 800,000 or a million metadata records. So giving multiple views on the data with restricted uh, pre-selected data sets can make can make a <clears throat> sorry can make a lot of sense and uh, yeah so we hope that will be an interesting direction to to go into for sure next year we'll be able to give some more updates on this this is uh, yeah, a typical technical work and, and infrastructure work you know you start working on the on the back end and then from there on you come towards something that can be integrated and used and is nicely uh, demonstratable so to say Metadata curation. Uh, thanks to the hard work of uh, Wolfgang, uh, we've made some really nice progress in terms of the, um, yeah, the, 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 the um, how to say, the, the efficiency of the link checker, which is part of the curation uh, dashboard. Um, and as you might know or not know, we have now a link checker that is kind of continuously checking all the links that we get from the metadata records in the Claren community. And we're really doing uh, checks of this 24-7. Uh, um, there were some performance bottlenecks there, but this has been really upgraded to a very nice level. We have some, well, it's actually a bit above that, but a conservative estimation would be something like 150,000 links being checked every day. And that basically means that, especially for the smaller uh, repositories, we have almost a daily check of all the links that are in there. And um, this is, of course, only part of the story because it's one thing to detect, for instance, broken links or, pro or problems. The other thing is, of course, to follow up on that. And because we now have a nice API that is exposing the broken links as a comma separated uh, value file, which you then can, uh, for instance, import into Google Sheets, we will also be able to provide um, yeah, neatly updated reports towards the centers with exactly the list of those links that we see are broken. Um, so if you are running one of these centers, don't be uh, scared if one of these days you get an email asking to look in these lists. Uh, we think this is really a very useful tool. And actually, this is typically also something that I think can be uh, useful and can be used outside the scope of the pure Claren infrastructure. If you look at, for instance, EOSC or other uh, infrastructural settings, this is also relevant for them. So we hope also to, in the end, to be able to set up something where the checking and the link checking can be broader than purely Claren. Also because it is quite a, yeah, an intensive process to check all these links and to follow up on uh, what is happening there. Finally, and again, this this reflects a bit uh, the API centrism of the of the uh, infrastructure. There's also a very nice addition that, as an end user, you can now um, acquire a token and submit 
a list of links or an individual link to be checked. And then you almost immediately get back the results uh, without the need of running something of your own. So you just submit it as a web service and then a bit later you get back the results and you have a good overview of what is, uh, yeah, what's the states and the activity of the URLs that are being checked. Again, there's a poster for this, so please take a look. Good, then we come to the content search, the federated content search. Um, so there's been, I mean, federated content search uh, activities have been uh, a bit low, low over the past years, but uh, s since uh, 2023, the development uh, of the aggregator, the plugins, and the protocol documentation has really been relaunched. I, I think we can thank uh, Eric Kerner for that. He has been uh, doing some great work uh, with, with much enthusiasm on uh, getting this uh, yeah, really up to speed again. And some of the novelties that we have seen is, for instance, uh, updated libraries for the base implementations. Uh, this is getting very technical, but uh, some of you might uh, recognize the, the updated SRU CQI bridge. Very, very important. I mean, it's um, yeah, a bit of uh, technology behind the scenes, but making the possibility to connect the federated content search endpoint, so exposing it to the Clarin network with some of the very popular corpus search uh, tools. There's an awesome uh, FCS list, which provides all kinds of relevant links on uh, a wiki page, quite nice. Uh, there's been some alternative front-end uh, implementations. This is actually also interesting because um, in the Text Plus project, there's been an alternative um, yeah, uh, graphical user interface that has been created for the FCS, making use of the same backend API. So again, this is illustrating why it is important to have nicely defined APIs, because then you can indeed provide those alternative frontends in order to get to the data. Uh, similarly, there's a prototype of the uh, FCS extension for lexical resources, again, with uh, thanks to uh, Text Plus, um, that basically allows you to search in yeah, dictionaries or lexica uh, with a specific view. I mean, this is all a bit experimental, but it shows the strength of the protocol and the possibilities of extending it, and also the kind of... Um, it's a nice illustration that if a group of centers are motivated to uh, do something in this in this realm, that it's possible and that they can easily take the existing protocol, plug in things in those locations that were foreseen for extension, and then in the end, uh, yeah, basically enrich it and connect it to uh, other or more resources. Good. Finally, bringing, getting to reliability, and this is... Um, about the uh, yeah, backend services and the monitoring that we are doing continuously of all our, uh, our services. Um, it's a kind of estimation, but for the nine central services that we are traditionally monitoring between October and August 23, um, uh, October 22 and August 23, we got to a kind of uptime availability of 99.99%. That's um, yeah, nice. Um, it might There might be some some a small overestimation of the uptime of one of the services. So uh, yeah, take it with a pinch of salt, but at least as you can see here also historically, um, the, the reliability of those services, I think we've reached a very nice level there. And most of the services are available during the year. Sometimes it can always happen that something happens, a server uh, is, is giving problems or we or network issues are showing up. We've seen that. Um, but in that case, also, you should always be able to go to status.clarin.eu where you have a nice dashboard and where you can see and follow those incidents and also where maintenance windows are announced. So we are getting in a regular basis updates from the centers telling us, oh, yeah, well, our server park will be renewed or there are some tests of the electricity uh, or, or backup functionalities uh, need to be tested and therefore the services will be unavailable. You can all find it on status.clarin.eu. Meetings and outreach. There's been a lot of activity in that sense as well. Um, I mean, uh, it's already been reported earlier on. Um, we have our virtual monthly meeting of the uh, center committee. In addition to that, we've had also our hybrid center meeting. Uh, well, just in, what was it, uh, June or so, I think, in, uh, in Utrecht. Um, where a lot of people showed up and it was actually a very nice atmosphere. And I personally all, always enjoy it also to talk to the people there and discuss some, some hot topics or new issues that come up and exchange, especially insights and information. 
Um, yeah, uh, many of you probably also have received the center news uh, over the, the past years, and we've recently even reached the 60th edition where we're just giving short updates about what's happening with the technical infrastructure. You can also find them through the website, by the way. And uh, the most recent thing that we have done is a launch of a technical open hours where we basically yeah, have uh, a, a dedicated time slot where everyone from uh, the development team and, and uh, who wants to join is actually around. And we're trying to emulate the kind of spontaneous coffee breaks that used to be there when uh, there were large meetings or actually like places like this, but for those people who cannot travel or who don't have the time and they can just join online and talk to anyone. And we try to do some kind of matchmaking between the specialists on the specific topics and people from the centers with questions. And uh, we've had two editions of it now, uh, very kind of unpredictable who actually will show up and what kind of questions it will be, but it was very interesting so far because we really saw some people who otherwise we didn't uh, know that they were working on, on parts of the infrastructure, on repositories, whatever. And they came up with interesting questions, uh, having some exchange. So yeah, I think so far the, the experiment has been going quite, uh, quite well. Uh, we'll have two more editions, one in November, one in December, then we will evaluate and if the system uh, works well which i think so far uh, it has been doing then we'll try to continue this uh, as a kind of tradition of having once a month such an uh, open hour um, yeah it's a, a new thing that was uh, suggested and uh, so far it's it's been quite uh, successful then finally a good moment to uh, announce uh, the launch of something uh, new uh, in, uh, within the Clarin infrastructure. Uh, when we had our strategy days in Ljubljana in, uh, I think it was in June, uh, uh, just before the summer, um, we got some very nice input also from, from national coordinators who said, yeah, well, maybe we should have a forum for, uh, for Clarin. And um, yeah, uh, we said, okay, well, we'll set it up and then we will test drive this. And uh, indeed, it's now available. If you go to forum.clarin.eu, you will find um, yeah, a fully functional, it's based on discourse uh, forum, um, with the idea that this should be a very uh, uh, low threshold way of asking questions, maybe sharing information, information um, yeah, just pointing to interesting discussions elsewhere. Um, so yeah, it's, it's still um, yeah, being set up a bit, but it's already usable. Uh, we will still connect it to the single sign-on, uh, at least for the, for the Clarin accounts, but this is still something that we are working on. Um, and I really would invite you to go there and take a look. Um, if only to uh, find an answer to the uh, hidden riddle that I had in my uh, presentation. I'm not sure if anyone has an idea what kind of recipe we have been cooking. Any? Ah, it's on the forum. You already looked. Yeah, true. Yeah, but please don't spoil it. Anyone else uh, who uh, wants to make a guess? Uh... Yeah, right, stew, indeed. This is, a, it's all a kind of ingredients that you can combine into traditional Flemish stew, uh, carbonade la flamande, uh, to be eaten with fries, of course. Um, and if you're curious about some of the recipes, indeed, uh, I've just posted before the meeting uh, in the off-topic uh, forum category, uh, two recipes for a traditional variant and a vegan variant where you can uh, have a look to uh, make your own, own, st own stew. And if you now um, get some of the ingredients while you're in Belgium, this is a good opportunity and then you can cook it at home and uh, yeah, uh, share the uh, culinary uh, knowledge that you have, uh, have gained. Um, I think that almost brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. Um, uh, and I think this, I mean, yeah, behind just the, the culinary aspect of this presentation, I think there's, there's an interesting aspect here as well in, in that sense that the infrastructure, um, you can always uh, see it as something that can be appreciated without necessary knowledge behind the scenes. So just as a stew, you can eat it, you can enjoy it. You don't necessarily need to know what's all in it, how many hours it has been uh, uh, simmering or been cooking. Um, but at the same time, it can also be nice to know what is actually happening there and to have a peek into the kitchen and see, okay, oh, it's this and this and this and this. So I hope today that with this view into the kitchen, uh, you were able to, to yeah, get a bit of appreciation for all the hard work that is uh, done uh, by lots of people behind the scenes. And, and that's always a kind of important recurring theme. I mean, uh, as I said, just for like for the federated identity, it seems so obvious it works uh, if everything works so well. Uh, but um, but lo many people have been doing hard and sometimes tedious work behind the scenes for this. So that's also why I would like 
to um, yeah uh, for the recipe would like to thank our uh, cooks and our uh, experts in the technical uh, infrastructure uh, from the center committee uh, the central development team and all the people in the task forces developers and uh, contributors uh, from the uh, from the national uh, consortia so please join me in a round of applause for those people who have been doing all part of Thank you very much.